So everyone's playing the game of life some way or another. And I try to show to them, these are the things that it takes to be a successful athlete. And these are the things that it takes to be successful in life, taking care of your body, taking care of your team, people around you. You're the best player for yourself so that your team can continue to win in the game of life. Welcome to the Imperfectly Empowered Podcast with DIY healthy lifestyle blogger, Anna Fulmer. Empowering you to transform your life one imperfect day at a time. This month, we are continuing to celebrate the upcoming episode, the 100th episode of the Imperfectly Empowered Podcast with a $100 Amazon gift card giveaway. If you have not entered yet, this is a final call, final reminder to be sure to click on the link in the show notes or on the blog post at hammersandhugs.com if you're watching on YouTube. Click on the link in the description. It is super easy to enter. We will announce the winner at the 100th episode on December 6th, where I will also be sharing some really, really exciting news for the Imperfectly Empowered podcast and what is coming in 2023. You do not want to miss it. I want you to come along for the ride. Be sure to enter to win that $100 Amazon gift card. And again, thank you from my heart. I would not be here if it was not for you. Welcome back to another episode of the Imperfectly Empowered Podcast. I am your host, Anna Fulmer. Today on the show, we have Rob Tracy. Rob is the founder and CEO of Trace Athletic Performance Strength Training, or TAPS. It is a program focused on strength and conditioning for an athletic physique, whether you are an athlete or not. Here to spill his secrets that have helped hundreds of clients transform their lives physically and mentally to live fit and strong. Welcome strength coach, Rob Tracy. This is exciting. I was thinking we haven't actually had a strength somebody who's especially focused on the strength training aspect of fitness and nutrition, although certainly Mm -hmm. you do all the things. So I'm excited to dive into the strength training element of it for our, for all of our listeners, but let's press rewind a little bit. I always like to hear some of the backstory. How did you get to where you are today? I know you were an athlete, um, rugby. Am I remembering that right? I was scrolling through Instagram. Did I make that up? Oh, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm actually still a rugby player. So that's, oh, are uh, you? That's so fun. Yeah. I took a probably about an eight year hiatus and just got back into it this past year. So yeah, I can, I can start saying that I'm officially an athlete again. So <laughs> I, that's, that's a good. whole nother conversation. What makes an athlete? That's like, we could do a whole yeah, podcast definitely. on that. If you're fit, does that mean you're an athlete? Um, I'm thinking, yeah, we can do a whole talk on that. So we could do a whole hour. I know my husband, I've talked about this so many times. Um, I would say the answer is no, by the way, anyone listening, (laughs) you can be in really good shape and not be an athlete, just like you can be an athlete and not be in really good shape. It's definitely true. Um, so tell us a little bit how you went, like, give us some of the backstory. So you have this program, it's called TAPS. Mm -hmm. Give us some of the backstory, how you even got to where you are today and what started your passion for strength training and helping other people. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the, everything started starting back from square one when I was a, when I was a real young kid, probably about, let's say like first grade kindergarten age, my parents got divorced. Hmm. Um, and then we were, I I was actually from Philadelphia right outside of Philly. Uh, do you know where Springfield is? It's like Delaware Um, County. Yes, actually not really well, but I mean, we're like an hour from Philly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was like 15 minutes outside of Philly okay. and, um, parents got divorced. I moved to New York. I was a short dweeby chunky little kid. Uh, I was way more into video games and TV and really against any kind of athletic movements or sports mm. or anything. Uh, parents were trying to push me to get into being some sort of activity when I was younger, but I always refused. I wanted to just kind of do things myself. Um, and then when my parents got split up and I was moving away, I didn't really understand what was going on because it's at such a young age, you don't really know. You kind of think, is yeah. it something something that I did? Why am I going away? Why don't I get to see both my parents all the time? Mm. Um, so I started developing some insecurities about myself. And then on top of basically being addicted to like peanut butter and snacks and watching TV, not the healthiest lifestyle. 
Um, so it was, and then moving school districts every year made it very difficult for me to make friends. So short, dweeby little kid, uh, no friends, seeking attention, but I don't know how to get the attention. Why were you moving uh, around so much? Why all the moving? Uh, we were just, my mom, my sister and I, we were looking okay. for different, like just for a good place to kind of root ourselves. So we were gotcha. moving to one place and then we ended up moving to another place. We were very inconsistent for a few years there. That's hard. Yeah. Um, especially when I was pretty young. So right. it wasn't until about third or fourth grade, uh, we had finally found a good place to establish ourselves. A small town called Highland in New York, upstate New York kind of area. Um, not too much going on there. A lot of apple farms and uh, a lot of cows. So not too much action. And walking Sounds into- Sounds like Lancaster, grade, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Lots of cows. Um, walking into like first first day of school, you know how the kids have like assigned seats so you can sitting next to people and you might not know who they are because you're such a young age. Uh, there was this quirky little dude, uh, spiky red, bright red hair. His name was Sean. And I sat next to him and quickly we became friends. And this was like my first real friend in such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that at the time, but becoming friends with this kid, Sean, was actually going to change my life. And mm -hmm. because his dad was actually the youth football coach. So hanging out with him, going over to his house, you know, after school and on the weekends and such. And his dad was um, kind of motivating and inspiring me to kind of come out for the football team. But I didn't. I don't know anything about football. I don't know anything. I just like playing like Pokemon and and eating junk food. But this kind of encouraged me because now I have a friend. His dad's kind of pushing me to go out and play in the sports. I was pretty terrible my first year. I was. I didn't play. Uh, it was everything was uncomfortable. Just moving around, my body hurt all the time. But that the warm up that we went through with all the jumping jacks and push ups and different things really kind of stuck with me. And I saw some of the other kids on the team who were playing a lot more and they were like the popular kids on the team. I noticed that they were much better at the warm up, and they could knock out more push-ups, and they could do things. And I could see that they were getting attention from a lot of other players. So I adopted this warm up that we were doing and I would start doing it myself at home on my own. Mm. Um, and then I started. And how to old were you yeah, here? It's like third, fourth grade. So wow. uh, that mm -hmm. must be like, I'm not like even 10. sure how old you are, like eight, nine. My yeah. daughter's so fourth. Yeah. Young. Yeah. So I started doing that all the time on my own at home. And then eventually I started getting a little bit better shape. And then within the next year, I transitioned to starting to play a little more until I eventually ended up becoming the starting running back on the team. So then mm. th that's clicked in my head. So if I'm exercising and starting to drink more water instead of soda at such a young age, I could see the immediate benefit of it. Mm. So then starting to play more starting to play more, started to develop more friends in the team, more friends in the team turned into friends outside of the team. So now I have more friends to hang out with after school and such. So now I'm starting to develop this attention and this confidence, which is the biggest part for me, was getting the confidence that I have value and I have a place. And it's and all these insecurities of mine started to slowly disappear, uh, being able to talk to more friends and kind of get out of my comfort zone just all from stemming from starting that one warm up, And it wasn't the whole entire warm up. It was, okay, I'm going to start with just a few jumping jacks and maybe do the plank and such for a little bit until I eventually built up, built up, built up. That led me into start, start tri-sport athlete. So I was captain on varsity for wrestling as a freshman in high school. So four years wrestling varsity captain, mm -hmm. lacrosse two-time captain and football two-time captain. And uh, that led me into the world of athletics and friendship and fun and really got me into the weight room more. And it was kind of getting the team together and pushing. So my coaches, then they put on some sort of, it was a little bit of a, like a pressure for me to be a role model for the other students. And then taking on that role model uh, characteristic, I guess, kind of brought me into leadership. And then that's kind of what got me into some coaching. And then mm -hmm. through college, I played football my freshman year. And that became too much of a job with, with like film sessions and mm -hmm. mandated, mandated, uh, mandated, like having to go to the library for library hours and such and all those things. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really be myself. And then that's when I switched over to rugby and quickly became a captain on the rugby team as well. We ended up going on and winning a uh, state title in college, which was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but then obviously as I was finishing undergrad, uh, 
I wasn't playing any more sports and I didn't have a place to kind of an outlet for myself that I was used yeah. to. But getting into personal training and strength and conditioning kind of brought back that team uh, camaraderie and that whole spirit of leadership and helping others work together towards a common goal, which obviously is be becoming better athletes and then working on a team and then uh, uh, working efficiently to win championships and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I transitioned into uh, the strength and conditioning world. It's hard. I had somebody else. Her name is Emily Kaufman. She was a elite college athlete. And we had this conversation too on the show, but this idea that it's really difficult when, whether it's athletics or it could be anything, but it's defined you so such a large part of your life for so long. And then you transition out of sports or for maybe somebody it's music or performing arts or whatever it is. And then suddenly you sort of enter the adult world where there's not that team element and the immediate end goal where it's like the end goal is to win a championship or whatever it is. It's hard, I think, for a lot of people that, to then create that lifestyle mindset. It's like still trying to find the joy that you found, not to mention the health and wellness potentially as well from staying fit. How do you, how have you seen in your coaching experience, what are some of the keys that you have learned to help men and women, but to help overcome that mindset where it's like, just because you don't, I think especially for men, this is a bigger deal. The whole sports, like I'm part of a bigger team. There's more motivating factors to stay in shape, to stay fit. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm running with a ball and I see the end zone. You know what I mean? It's like a much more objective goal. So how do you encourage people to maintain a mindset of fitness and a lifestyle of it, as opposed to just that 12 week transformation? And then you're done. The all or nothing mindset is, I guess, what I'm asking. How do you avoid that? I'm not exactly the best way of avoiding it, but I know for me, it's it's really a, adopting that mindset as part of who you really are. So going back mm -hmm. to how we kind of talked earlier, how I had mentioned that I just got back in, into rugby. Um, when I first started going, I remember back in back in college playing all the time as a captain. I was confident. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew my position so well, and I knew how to play, and I knew how to play well. And now coming back after such a long time, I was a little hesitant at first, and then I didn't have the same confidence of who I was. And even though I knew I was still working out and I was still uh, active and and I still know how to play, um, but I had that that fear, that kind of idea in the back of my head that I'm I'm now an ex-athlete. So that's what made me a little hesitant. It wasn't until the first match where I kind of got it back in. I'm like, hey, I, I still am an athlete. I might not be the same athlete, but I still am an athlete. I'm still playing. Mm -hmm. I'm still moving. And that kind of clicked in my head that I need to continue doing the things that are important to be a successful athlete that I learned so far back in my earlier years of life. And I think that's important for a lot of my clients to kind of adapt to like, um, you are still an athlete no matter what you do. So I treat a lot of my clients, whether they do play recreational or uh, more competitive type sports, I treat everybody as an athlete because everyone's mm -hmm. playing the game of life some way or another. So everyone mm -hmm. has, everyone is their own player in their own game. So I treat everyone like an athlete and I try to show to them, these are the things that it takes to be a successful athlete. And these are the things that it takes to be successful in life taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, taking care of your team, people around you, family, mm -hmm. coworkers, friends, things like that. So it's much more than just the making sure you go to the gym. It's right. making sure that you're you're the best player for yourself so that your team uh, can continue to win in the game of life. Yeah, I love that. I love that concept. And just to reiterate, what you're saying is that whether a client is or was an athlete in the like logistical sense of the word, whether you played a sport or you didn't play a sport, when you're coaching clients, you are approaching them like you would an athlete who's part of a team. You're helping people embrace this concept that regardless of whether you were actually in a sport or not, you are in a sport. It's the game of life. And basically you are helping coach them through what it looks like to thrive in that game that they're playing holistically well, regardless of whether they were actually at ever at any point in their life 
part of a sport. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And that's such a great point. I think, especially for a lot of the women listening who might be like, well, I was never an athlete. This doesn't really apply to me. This is what he is saying. He's making the point that we are all athletes in the game of life. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And just like we would approach an athlete on a team, there are concepts that are appropriate for any of us in thriving, especially when you can adopt that athletic mindset. I am. It's interesting. I don't know. I know you work primarily with men, right? Would you say that's probably more often? Yes. Yeah. And you've worked with some women too. Yeah. I've worked with people, uh, both male, female, everything, everything under the sun. And uh, the youngest people that I've worked with were age three years old. So I've worked with very young. Yeah. It's a lot of movement prep, just kind of Uh holding yourself in positions. And it was, it was really easy for me because the, he was working with two older brothers who were uh, five and eight. So yeah. he was role modeling them. So it was pretty easy to getting them yeah. to do movement patterns and stuff. But then That's I've also worked hilarious. with individuals in their late 70s. Early yeah. 80s. So I've worked with the full yeah. spectrum of people. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if you have seen this or not, but in my experience as a fitness and nutrition coach, I, I find that um, men struggle more with that all or nothing mentality, meaning they, they go hard for a brief period of time, but then they struggle to maintain moderation outside of that intense period, um, where women also struggle with all or nothing, but I found that they are, I think it's actually more nurtured in them, meaning like society pushes them to the all or nothing mentality in especially fitness and nutrition or just life, but they're more interested in pursuing balance where I don't know if it's just sort of more of the nature of of men and the desire to be leaders and strong or whatever. But I have found that um, I have a harder time helping my male clients maintain moderation outside of that intense, you know, for my initial, it's an initial six weeks. Um, have you found any tips for your clients to have, even within that initial, I think you do 12 week transformations and they like, they just totally mess up a day of nutrition or they miss their exercises, whatever it is. What, what are some of the things that you have found helpful in your own life? And then in communicating to clients to push through embrace and perfect progress type of a mentality. Have you learned anything about that over the years or in your own life? Yeah, definitely. Um, for I'd, it always seems to go back to consistency, and yeah. I try to I try to bring I try to track and monitor as much information and data points as possible, so mm. that we can look at big picture and we can look where we started and how much we've progressed and overcome, and making sure that my clients know that it's okay to not be a hundred percent all the time, a hundred percent on a hundred percent of the time. Um, and then also understanding that when you do slip up or there is a bad workout, that it's okay. And it's time to just turn around and get back on it and get back into the swing of things. And I'm totally transparent and open and honest with my clients and uh, audience that some days I don't even feel like hitting my workouts. And some days I'll go in and I'll hit my, I uh, won't hit anything near the numbers that I'm in, expected to hit, but mm-hmm. just getting in and just kind of going through the motion and making sure that I'm staying disciplined and consistent to the best that I can. Mm-hmm. So that I can look back on it as I'm still following through and trying my best to get to where I need to go. So yeah, I, think- I love the concept of the data points. I think that's something that we we miss a lot. And I mean, this is one of the reasons that you need to be making realistic goals that are trackable. I've talked about this before, but one of the main reasons that we don't hit our goals is because they're not specific enough. And that's not a goal that we have put any plan in place to actually be able to track that progress. And what you just said, I think is brilliant because that's why we do that. So when you have that day that, you know, you ate an entire chocolate cake or whatever the case may be, um, or you had French fries for breakfast, (laughs) did you say, or you eat two? Yeah. (laughs) Or you eat two chocolate cakes. I mean, whatever, whatever the scenario (laughs) is, when you are tracking your progress, like you just said, you can look back and remind yourself, okay, I started at these measurements. And now I'm at this measurement, regardless of the fact that I just ate two chocolate cakes. 
And that's progress. Mm-hmm. And we're going to celebrate that. I always say grace for today, but no excuses tomorrow. <laughs> so oh, that's, that's kind of that, that concept. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, stay tuned. We're going to play a speed round of this or that with Rob. And we're going to hear more of his expert advice on strength training to live fit and strong right when we come back from this break. You have tried it all. Worried you will never lose the extra weight or reclaim the energy you once enjoyed? Want to achieve fat loss without spending hours in a gym or eliminating entire food groups from your diet? Well, now you can. In the virtual Faster Way to Fat Loss with Anna, my six-week fitness and nutrition program, you will learn how to pair effective 30-minute workouts with all-natural, evidence-based nutritional strategies to leverage what you eat and when you eat to reset your metabolism and burn fat fast, even that stubborn belly fat. I am a dual-certified nurse practitioner passionate about teaching sustainable strategies to promote fat loss and prevent disease. I have cheered on thousands of clients who have done just that with the Faster Way program. In my six-week program, the average client currently sheds seven inches of body fat. 93% report more energy and 89% state that their mental health has improved. 100% of clients report they feel this program is sustainable. Curious to try the program but not sure if the strategies will work for you? Try the Faster Way strategies for free. Head to www.hammersandhugs.com and sign up for my free 7-Day Fat Loss Accelerator course today and start your own transformation story. All right, we are back here with Rob Tracy. Okay, Rob, you're going to get Two options, no stress, whichever one comes to mind first. Burger or a hot dog? I'm going to go with burger. Where's your favorite burger you've ever had in your life? You know, that's a great question. I think um, first thing that pops in my head is Bear Burger here in Stanford. I'm always lo- looking for a good burger spot because I feel like I crave burgers often, but Same. there's not too many good Just spots. Just had one last me. night. <laughs> nice. Um, so you said Samford, Connecticut. Yeah, Stanford, Connecticut. Yep. And it's called Bear what? It's called Bear Burger, B-A-R-E Burger. Okay. Bear Burger. I have so many restaurant recommendations on my podcast. I love it. Okay. Nice. Bear Burger and Samford, Samford, Connecticut. We'll make sure that's in the show notes because food is important and it was meant to be enjoyed, including burgers. Um, okay. Coffee or tea? I'm going to go with tea. Oh, tea. Okay. What kind of tea? Not a big tea person, but I, so I guess green tea, because that's probably the most that I've consumed, I guess. And you're not a big coffee person? No, not really. No. Oh, and you're still smiling and you're upright. <laughs> Whew. I need a sip of coffee now. Um, okay. Cake or pie? I think I'm going to go with pie. Favorite pie? Pumpkin pie. Ooh, right season coming up. What's your favorite? Have you ever had Costco's pumpkin pie? I don't think so. It's really, really good. The secret is heavy cream. Not shockingly. <laughs> <laughs> it is really delicious. Highly recommend it if you like pumpkin pie. I'll check um, it out. Yeah, you really, you really need to. Or don't. Or else you might eat two pumpkin pies. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the chocolate cakes. Uh, okay. Would you rather lift in the gym or play basketball outside? I would probably, I'd rather lift gym, lift in the gym. If I could lift, lift outside, that would be the big winner. But yeah, that would be a winner. We always, we, all these like houses that we've renovated, we always try to set up our weight rack in our garage <laughs> for that very reason. Cause it kind of feels like an outdoor gym, even though it's not at all. And then when the temperature gets to below 40, it's just depressing, but yeah. yes, outdoor gym. Have you ever heard of uh, a company called Beaver Fit? No. They make uh, weather durable uh, fitness equipment and squat racks and such like that. What? Yeah. I bought one during COVID and I could set it up outside and it's Interesting. completely weatherproof. What's it made out of? I have no idea. Like a That's, rubber, almost like a heavy rubber I think so. or something. Yeah. Or silicone? They, I think there's some kind of uh, protectant stuff that they put on it. I'm not too huh. sure. So then what do you, do you have a set inside then? Because I mean, you're on the East Coast like us, cold. Yeah. No. So the, so the setup that I had 
purchase. It's that stays up at my mom's house, upstate New York, where I'm yeah. living here in Stanford is in an apartment complex. And okay. we have an amazing gym facility downstairs, two squat racks, dumbbells yeah. up to 80 and a bunch of machines and treadmills and such. That's awesome though. I love that idea. At least you could use it in the summer, spring and fall. Yeah. Hmm. Beaver what? What was it called? Beaver fit. Beaver fit. Ooh, mm-hmm. we'll have to look that one up. Um, Okay, would you rather play rugby or football? I think I'd stick with rugby. Rugby? Yeah. And then this is probably an obvious answer, but cardio or weights? Definitely weights. And if you're doing cardio, what are you what's your preference? Uh nice slow going outside for a walk. Get the steps a walk. up. Walk. Yeah. So that's not really cardio then. You're going for a slow walk. Uh, I love it. So it's nice and easy. I, I can't. It's it nice as to get cardio. outside. Yeah. Unless you're like speed walking and really moving your hips like some of these women do outside my house. Maybe. Yes. My my cardio is it's majority of the time it's just going out for a nice easy walk. And then yeah. when I when I'm actually putting in some sweat time, it's uh like in sprint intervals. So like yeah. suicides almost shuttle runs. Yeah. So. so your easy walk is like more your steps. Yeah. But yeah. I do it so often, yeah. And and then it's the uh, interval I love because it's put yourself through all the pain for about 10 minutes and then I'm done. So it's not too yeah. long. Yeah. This brings us to an interesting point. So what he's talking about, and many people don't know this. I have a podcast coming on this. But you know what he's kind of talking about with uh, cardio and exercise is an interesting... Um, there's like two different things called non-exercise activity thermogenesis and exercise activity thermogenesis. But thermogenesis is basically talking about the concept of the calories burned, the energy that we need to to move. And um, this is something that a lot of people don't understand as one of the secrets to staying lean and fit is increasing that day-to-day caloric energy burn. And so what Rob is addressing, like with that constant, you said you do it a lot, like you just go for walks. That is what I would say is basically that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It is increasing your daily steps. Your heart rate may not be elevated to that like cardioprotective, uh, you know, the benefits that we get from uh, moderate to high intensity exercise. But talk to me a little bit about that and what you talk about with your clients, because especially when we when we address staying shredded, especially in our midsection People always want to know, like, what are the secrets to staying lean when you don't live in a gym all day and you're not eliminating entire food groups from your diet? I think this is one of the secrets is is non-exercise activity thermogenesis that people don't understand. They're actually not moving that much. So talk to me a little bit. I'm sure you've talked about this with your clients. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. It's it's uh, for because, some reason. Oh, yeah. All right, guys, it, buckle up. This I'm not the only one saying this. Listen to Rob. Yeah, for some reason, it's like the biggest secret in the world, I guess, that nobody understands. It's just yes. going out, getting a little bit of extra steps in when you can. Like grocery yeah. store, park a little bit further away, get a few extra steps. Um, like standing more times during the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually have a great, great example of this is I did a step challenge about two years ago in August. And in my apartment complex, I live on the 12th floor. So I would take the stairs down, I'd go out for my walk, and I'd come back mm-hmm. inside, and then I'd take the stairs back up so I'd get the extra steps. Up on the 12th floor is kind of kind of a little bit of a hike sometimes, especially if you're out tired yes. after working out and a long day of work. Um, but I had a friend come, and he was stopping by, and he was picking up some uh, protein powder. And I was, I was, he texted me, told me that he was going to be downstairs. So I was like, okay, I'll run down. Ran downstairs. I'm walking around outside, getting a couple extra steps in, waiting for him to arrive. Text him a few times, no answer. So then I go back inside to take the stairs back up because that's what I'm holding myself to. Mm-hmm. Two minutes later, I got a phone call <laughs> that he's that he's here. So I'm like, great. So I run Meanwhile, back, you're drenched in sweat. <laughs> run back downstairs and then I go find him outside, um, give him the protein and then come back inside. And I'm like, man, I'm so exhausted. I just got to get back upstairs. I just can't wait to just flop and chill out for the rest of the day. Um, But I told myself I was going to take the stairs. And as I'm walking through the apartment, going up the building, I hop in the elevator and I get out on the 12th floor, completely 
not conscious of what I was doing. I was just sucked into my phone. Realized I walked out of the elevator and I go, oh. I told myself I was going to take the stairs. I have mm -hmm. to take the stairs. So right then and there, I, I ran back down the stairs, didn't take the elevator down. I ran down, got to the bottom step, turned around, walked back up. I said, there's got to be a lesson in here somewhere about accountability <laughs> and discipline. So Right. Well, and this, I mean, that is such a perfect example. Um, this is something that I've, I've talked about before, this idea of just increasing your steps. But there, you know, people might say, well, is it really like a big deal to park farther away and walk? Like how much is that really, how many calories is that really burning? And the problem is when you look at it in isolation, just one time, yeah, it's probably not burning that many extra calories to park further away and walk. But when you add that up day after day and you take all those opportunities, like what you're saying, if time is not an issue and you can take the stairs, take the stairs in the airport, I never, unless time is, is an issue, which has happened, you know, like I never take the walkway. I always just walk like we've become such a sedentary society in ways that we don't even think about anymore. And I love what you said about your phone. Because I think we're all guilty of this because technology is such a massive part of our day-to-day -day lives now. Not only does it keep us on our butt, like since I left emergency medicine, I have never been more sedentary because I'm now in a virtual job. So I'm in front of a computer all the time. Like on Wednesdays, I sit for a couple hours on these calls. I could stand, but it's not the setup I have going on here. But the point is, we're on our butts way more than we used to be. And the phones distract us. And it is harder to be on your phone and walk up 12 flights of stairs than it is to just use the elevator. So it's a perfect example of where we need to be more conscious of not only just getting off of technology, but how to put it away that will also give us the ability to move more. How can we like start to shift that? So you mentioned a couple things. So sorry, go ahead. But oh. I'm just going to say you mentioned parking farther away. Mm -hmm. um, also, P.S. If there, if you are young and capable of walking, and there's the, this drives me insane. And there's like the old lady who's waiting to park. I, that like drives me nuts. And then somebody just pulls in, and like what in the world, people? Oh, and you want to look fit, and you want a secret pill? No, the secret pill is taking the parking spot further away. Sorry, it's such a pet peeve of mine. So park further well, yeah. away, take the stairs, stand by a standing desk. Um, I'm trying to think of what else you said. They're all brilliant. And I interrupted you. Go ahead. I got on a roll. Oh, uh, no, I was <laughs> just going to say with uh, how you had mentioned that parking further away one time isn't going to create that huge impact on everything, but parking further away consistently over time. Right that becomes part of who you are. So you become the person who walks a little bit further. And then that right. goes back to the whole adopting the mindset of, okay, I am more fit or I am still an athlete. And this is part of the game. This is where I have to, I park further away because I walk a little bit more because I can, whereas mm -hmm. the elderly woman might need to park closer. Yeah. So that's well, and I love that you said you become in some ways, you almost become what you do. And it's that same concept of, you know, the, the client of mine who lost, you know, 30 excess pounds of body fat. And one of the things that just blew her mind was how she no longer felt out of breath walking around a park with her kids. And it's like, now she actually goes to the park more with her kids for that very reason, because now she's stronger and she's more fit and she's adopting that, that mentality. So it's, it's like, what do you want out of your life and what small ways can you be setting yourself up for success today to become that person while still recognizing that you are fully valuable as you are today, that your value is not tied to whether or not you're out of breath walking to the grocery store. That's not where your value is. But if you would like to walk to the store with more energy, <laughs> then what can we do today to help you make those changes? With that in mind, let's talk about beginner tips. Strength training beginner tips. This is a question that I think for myself, it's easy to just, I, I forget sometimes that some people have never lifted a weight. I just grew up around sports. So to me, it's like, I have to remind myself that not everybody had the same, you know, athletic background. 
So if somebody who's never lifted weights before, never really done strength training, or maybe it's a guy who is frankly very intimidated because he doesn't want to be a gym bro, or there was like those guys and that's not him. But now he recognizes that he needs to <laughs> do something. Give me some strength training beginner tips. Where do you even start? I would say it's much like starting anything new for the first time. Start slow, simple, and and don't don't overcomplicate anything. So um, p- there are hundreds of different variations of exercises, but to me, there's only a handful of actual movement patterns. So one, starting very slow and simple, picking a few movements and just kind of getting good at doing those first. Two, hiring a coach, hi- having a friend or a buddy, somebody who can help you kind of mm. work through the um, work through the weeds as as like you're trying to get better at becoming getting into the gym and getting more comfortable with things. Because having a buddy or a coach can certainly help uh, make you feel better and more confident in the gym. But yeah, starting slow, starting simple, and don't overcomplicate things. Do you um, like? Is there a way? for the guy who maybe doesn't want to go into the gym or, or woman who's just like, I want to do something at home. Are there like strength training beginner tips for somebody? What could they be doing at home? Maybe it's just body movement and using your weight as resistance. What kinds of things could somebody be starting at home to sort of build up that confidence to step in the gym? Maybe I hear that more from women, but I feel like there's probably some guys out there too, who would be like, ah, I feel like I need to be a little bit more confident before I step into a gym. What can they be doing oh, at home? Uh, yeah, like there definitely are guys who are a little intimidated with the gym. E- anytime, even when I go to a new gym, it's a little like a little intimidating sometimes because you don't yeah. know who's there or what's going new kid on. on the I, block. Yeah, I have a master's in exercise science and I still get a little intimidated sometimes walking into new places. Yeah. But um yeah, starting at home, starting with body weight exercises like push-ups, body weight squats, some planks, just different easy movements that you can look up quickly online and start practicing mm. at home. Um, now you're in the comfort of your own home, so you don't have to worry about other people and you just build up that confidence and those movements and then scheduling time to try to get to the gym because spending more time in the gym is going to make you more comfortable with the with the place itself. Um, yeah. I know people who have been deathly afraid of going to the gym and they just started off with just going to the gym for five minutes, going and turning around Mm -hmm. and leaving and just building that Mm -hmm. habit of just going to the gym and eventually getting there, walking on the treadmill for 10 minutes and then Mm, walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes and then doing one exercise on in the weight room section Mm -hmm. and then kind of building up from there. So starting very slow, simple, starting at home and then gradually building up that confidence to going to the facility itself. I love that. That's a great idea. Um, how do you, from a strength training standpoint, this is a slightly more advanced question, but for people who are already kind of comfortable in a strength training rhythm, or they have equipment at home, or they're regularly going to the gym, how do you encourage splits, like workout splits for muscle gain? Um, for those of you listening who are like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's, from what I understand, I'm not a strength training expert, but there's like five basic movements basically speaking, you've got your upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull. That's just like quads, hamstrings, triceps, biceps, et cetera. And then core, if we're really going to break it down. So there's like, do you do total body a couple times? Do you do like legs one day, upper body? Like how do you, in your experience, how have you seen the best results in terms of splitting up those strength training workouts and how sure. often yes sure so it it's when i write for myself i base it off of it's typically a full body style ish workout it's kind of kind of confusing i know that might sound a little uh wonky but um i train like i like i said earlier i train everybody like an athlete and mm-hmm. athletes are different from bodybuilders so bodybuilders like to isolate different body parts mm, and that's movements. a great point and I treat myself and everyone as an athlete. So as an athlete, you are one unit on the field of whatever game you're playing. So the body has to move in different directions and movements and all the muscles have to work together. So when I'm programming for myself and many of my clients, I'll typically pick one of those major movements 
that you had just mentioned, one of those movement patterns, and pick one of the major lifts for that. And I'll kind of dictate that as the day. So for example, Monday might be a squat pattern day and the next day might be like a horizontal push day. So like a bench press. And mm -hmm. those might be the main focus. So that kind of dictates the day. That's going to be how the program or workouts can start. But you're going to have a lot of encompassing exercises and movement patterns that work synergistically with that. So if you are on like a bench press day, I'm also going to be doing a lot of upper uh, back and maybe some a lot of core loaded carry. So you're getting a bit a full body workout mm -hmm. every day. But the main focus is on one specific movement pattern each day. As I got gotcha. primary focus. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause even like a core, well, the reality is most core workouts require the extremities to move. Yeah. That's like, again, a whole nother podcast. We ought to have Rob back. We ought to, I've already like thought of a couple of things that we could dive into a lot deeper, but this is like a whole nother, you know, the secret of abs that people don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in order to really isolate your abs, you don't want to be totally fatiguing all of your other muscles first. Like, why do we leave abs for last? I'll never understand it because you have to use a lot of those other muscles in order to work out your core. So if all those other muscles are fatigued, then your abs are like getting, you know, a kind of shoddy workout because you're too exhausted to actually appropriately work out mm -hmm. your abs. So there's a free tip. I haven't even put that podcast episode out yet. <laughs> Don't leave your abs for last or incorporate them into the workout as you go so that you're not totally fatigued before you even do your, your ab workout. What? Let's just really quickly talk nutrition. Sure. If you could give one principle that you see as like an overarching sort of repeat pattern, meaning this one thing nutritionally has been the most, um, created the most massive gains for your clients, what would it be? Like, do you have like one thing that you've seen nutritionally that you consistently find successful for your clients? That's a really hard question, by the way, because nutrition is such a complex. <laughs> uh, my answer, I'm not even sure if it's going to be considered part of nutrition, but I'm going to mm. go with hydration, just drinking more water. Oh yeah, that counts. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. I wasn't sure because it's not, not like depending on what kind of water. It's not, it's not yeah. Like, yeah. I got you. We'll, like, we'll allow yeah. it. We'll allow <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, drinking more water because mm. I, I, I feel like everybody you think you drink enough water, but you really, you're not drinking enough water. I feel like everybody Truth. can make a little more effort to make sure that they're drinking, uh, carrying water bottle around is so simple. So just make sure you can kind of fill that up whenever you can and make sure you're just drinking it at all the opportunities you got. 100%. Our body is made up of a lot of water. And I did a podcast episode on how to drink more water every day. And one of the things that people don't realize too, is Again, speaking from a medical standpoint, a lot of headaches, those feelings of palpitations, there are little symptoms that you may be experiencing fairly regularly that may just simply be because of the fact you're not drinking enough water and caffeinated beverages do not count mm -hmm. as water, just as a side note. So water, that's great. Do you have a, no I, I have a number that I give my clients. Do you have a number that you recommend for water intake? Uh, I do not. What does, what do you recommend or, uh, target for your clients? So I usually say half of your body weight in ounces. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning if you, so like I would weigh a hundred, probably, I don't even know. I don't ever weigh myself probably 135 pounds, 130 pounds. So like for me, I would need about, so yeah, I'm doing math live. <laughs> this is a problem. Uh, what is half of 130? What 65? <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, yeah. So like 65 ounces then. So if I weigh 130 pounds, 65 ounces in water a day, basically because yeah. of the body's water requirements, if it's made up of that much, that much water, you need to be drinking a lot more than you probably are. So that's a great, that's a great answer, especially if you're then exercising. This is the other thing you body is using water all of the time, whether you're working out or not. So then add extra activity to it. Then you're really probably under hydrating. So that's, that is brilliant. Oh yeah. I feel like people, when they're working out, they bring one small water bottle and they think that's going to keep them working yep. out the best that they can. I go through like two or three water bottles when I'm lifting and that's just, and I, and I'm not going super intense. It's just right. kind of casual going through. So. Yeah. And just keeping water bottles at your 
daily places of work. So that for a stay at home mom, that could be when you're making dinner every night, you know, you have a water bottle there that you're consuming, or if you have a long drive for commute, like having a water bottle that you keep in the car, water doesn't really go bad. I mean, as long as you're not putting other things into that water bottle, like you can just keep a water bottle full of water pretty much anywhere. It's lukewarm, but (laughs) that's all right. What is the, what is the number one thing that, um, when you were working with your clients, this is also an on the spot question, but can you think of something that people come to you and they think this about fitness and nutrition, but actually this is true. Meaning this is like the one thing, the one mistake or wrong thing that people are doing and thinking. And then you realize you're telling them like, actually, this is the case. Yeah. I feel like I have a couple of those, but I, the biggest one, this is also might not be the exact one that you might be thinking, but prioritizing sleep. Oh, amen. 100%. Oh, I love sleep. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So many people think that they, they are getting enough sleep or they're getting mm. enough quality sleep and really they're not, or they have poor habits before bed and rising. You optimizing your bedtime and your sleep patterns can impact your health greatly. And it can really change a lot. It can change your performance in the gym, your performance at work, just your yep. mood, the way you're thinking, your attitude, everything just working on your sleep a little bit. And it's not too hard to kind of fix and improve on what your, your current situation for your sleep patterns too. So it's easy. Okay. To let's build dive into up. sleep. That was, that was a great answer. Not, I had several in my own head that I would have answered and that was not it. And yet that is golden. Sleep is the body's holistic reset button. And it absolutely can affect that. So that's a, an excellent one. Poor sleep can inhibit fat loss for a lot of reasons and promote chronic diseases. How do you encourage people to improve their sleep? First thing I try to do do is is to try to get consistent with a bedtime routine and then a morning routine. Uh, Too many people, I believe too many people hit the the alarm goes off in the morning. And if they snooze, they snooze. And that's just setting you up for failure for the rest of the day. And I feel that everybody wasted a last minute in the morning. So they're rolling out of bed and rushing, trying to get everything going. And right there off the bat, you're in a stressful environment and your body is mm. already in chaos. So getting a morning routine and a bedtime routine and trying your best to stick to that seven days a week. Because a lot of people like to sleep in and they're waking up early during the week and then they sleep in during the weekend and then they're just destroying their um, circadian rhythm and, and like their whole pattern. So trying your best to stay consistent through all seven days of the week is where I like 100%. to start. 100%. That's and research has made very clear, and it's perfect that you said that. I've mentioned this before. One of the most determining factors of deeper REM sleep, like you just said, the circadian rhythm, is trying to go to bed and wake up at approximately the same time, which is I'm better at the wake up. The going to bed is where it's a little harder to go to bed at exactly the same time. But to your point, though, the bedtime routine can be very helpful. What kinds of things? When you say bedtime routine, somebody might be like, "Um, I brush my teeth, I get in bed. What would you say a bedtime routine, a healthy one might look like? I believe it starts pretty much as soon as the sun starts going down. I know here in the East Coast right now, it seems like it's... It's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon and the sun's gone. That's what it feels like. Yeah, it's insane. (laughs) But so as, as the sun is going down and kind of transitioning your electronic devices to like a nighttime mode, if you can... Mm. Um, and then just kind of getting into a pattern. So eating dinner and then what, what's going on after dinner, if you're eating dinner, what, like you taking a shower, maybe brush your teeth, those certain things, dedicating a specific time of no electronics before bed to kind of wind down, maybe some kind of journaling or spending time with the family. And, uh, a big thing too, is getting into changing into bedtime clothes that is specifically mm-hmm. designed. I know a lot of guys, a lot of my friends, They just wear gym shorts and such to Mm -hmm. go to sleep at night. Yeah. But your body picks up on these little cues of the material of the clothing that you're wearing. So if you wear the same clothes to go to the gym and you're all hyped up Mm. uh, and working out, but you're also wearing the same material to go to sleep at night, the body picks up on those small things. So having set pairs of clothing for bedtime, 
setting the temperature so that it's a little bit cooler so you can fall asleep a lot easier. And then just getting into like a repetitive pattern. So maybe brushing your teeth, setting your clothes out for the next day, um, maybe a little bit of reading, some small things like that can kind of stack up. And once you have a longer uh, routine where there's many things kind of getting you into the pattern, it makes it much easier because then your body's like, okay, as soon as I brush my teeth, I start to get a little bit sleepier. I get my clothes out. I'm a little more tired. I lay down. I reflect on certain things. Mm-hmm. That kind of, it's like a domino effect of getting yourself to fall asleep at night. It's perfect. And and the irony is we do this very well for our children, but then we forget that we benefit from it as well. So it really is, it's that same concept of setting that routine for yourself. Those are, those are perfect. I love what you said about pajamas. I've said that about sheets, similar concept that sheets can actually pillowcases can all make a difference, but that's an interesting. So what way? Cause my husband would be like, I mean, he like hardly wears any clothes to get fit because he gets so hot. So like, what are you telling people? Like, just don't wear gym shorts is what you're saying. Like maybe buy a pair of shorts you're not wearing to the gym. Yeah, that's kind of like what I have. I have like a select fit pair of like tank tops and gym shorts that I I wear to sleep. And then I have my other clothes that I wear for the gym and such. That's a great point. That's a really good point. I've actually even started to um, incorporate like the body washes and soaps that I have. So Mm. I I mean, this could just be totally just something that I made up. But now when I'm waking up in the morning, I have a specific uh, scent that I use. So so now I'm training myself to, okay, when Mm -hmm. I'm using this soap, it's time to wake up. When I'm using Mm -hmm. this soap at the end of the day, it's time for me to start falling asleep and kind of getting ready to go to bed type of thing. Yeah, it's a sensory trigger. That makes sense. It's like you're programming your body. It's like why, again, we use like lavender soaps for kids before bed at night. I mean, what you're doing is perfect. It's exactly, it's literally what people do to help kids sleep better. And yet we're not doing it for ourselves. So that's, that's a great idea too. Or maybe just even like hand lotions that have lavender in or something, the same point that you're making. Yeah. Program yourself that this is what you put on before bed, or this is what you use. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit um, about your, about taps, about your coaching program what it looks like it does it is it virtual or do people have to be in person um i work in both hybrid styles so i'm okay. meeting with people in person and online uh that okay. way if for some reason in person if our schedules don't mesh we have a, the ability to still hit our sessions and our workouts um mm-hmm. but yeah so that's it's an ever growing type of uh program so i'm just evolving constantly trying to add new things to it mm-hmm. uh but it pretty much originated back when I was transitioning out of uh, athletics as much. And I was more strength and conditioning in a private sector. And mm-hmm. then in the private sector and private facilities, I started personal training a little bit more. And my hours were skyrocketing, working sometimes 60, 70 hours, like multiple weeks in a row, just really mm-hmm. burning out. Um, so then I was trying to figure out how can I make more impact? How can I help more people? Um, and continue to grow as a, as a business, as a person, as a coach and helping all these people. So that's where I got into the online world. And that's also where my product line started too. Uh, A lot of my clients were always asking me about different proteins and multivitamins to use. And instead of recommending all these big name brands that you can find in like GNC and such, I I put in the time to research manufacturers Mm. and different ingredients and such to the point where I started creating my own line. Started off with just a vanilla protein powder and slowly built that up. So now I have all the supplements, all the products that I take are, uh, they're all for like basically for myself and my types of clients. So Mm -hmm. it's an exclusive product line that my, my clients get when they sign up with coaching with me. That's awesome. And you, and sorry, just to reiterate, do you take virtual only clients? Uh, I am taking virtual only clients. I have people all over the world. Um, that are working with me, checking in on a weekly basis and uh, working on their goals. How do you, so if somebody is listening and they're like, Oh, I'd be very interested to learn more to walk them through a little bit of the process. So like if they sign up with you for virtual strength training, what does that look like for them? Sure. So you, you get your uh, program for, for like you specifically. So you have the 12 weeks of training. Um, we start off with baseline, getting figuring out where we're at currently and mm-hmm. designing the plan to get to where we want to be down the road. Uh, we have weekly check-ins where we hop on a Zoom call 
and making sure that we're doing our homework. And we set small homework habits for us to specifically to work on during the week that'll continue moving us forward. Um, mm -hmm. And now I'm trying to have uh, have that become more of a staple thing. So the more accountability checking in with each other type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then at the, I, I also want to point this out. We'll make sure that we have all the links for Rob attached, but your Instagram account is a great place for people to follow you and hang out with you. You share a lot of your clients' transformations. And I love, I, I just love seeing that. So there's some amazing transformations on there, but you also share a lot of tips, how to's with specific exercises. Even I love the one you had on five points of contact, I think for a bench press. And it was just mm -hmm. really practical, but things that yeah, I think we often don't think about, you know, we're really struggling. Like maybe your hips are lifting off the bench or, you know, like how to really maximize those movements. Mm -hmm. So where else can people find you? What else do they need to know? If you've not already been convinced that Rob is an excellent resource, if you want to get shredded and live fit and lean, then I'm not sure what else he would say to convince you. But in case, what else do you want them to know? And where can they where can they hang out with you more? Uh, like you said, Instagram is probably the, the best and easiest option to get in contact with me or just to ask me questions or just to hang out and check out some of my stuff I got going on. Uh, but my website is also another great spot you can go to, and that's just taps, T-A-P-S hyphen training.com. Um, there's, I'm starting to put more blogs information up there. So that's slowly becoming a resource for more information mm -hmm. for people, but you can check out all the different products I have and coaching opportunities there too. But, but social media on Instagram is probably going to be the best and quickest place to get more information. And your handle is Rob. What's your handle again? It's just at Rob Tracy. So my name, uh, yeah. R-O-B-T-R-A-C as in cat, Z as in zebra. Yeah. So Rob Tracy, and we'll make sure all of that is included on, on the show notes. Rob, I it's so fun. I love following you and all of your tips. I love your whole approach. We will probably need to do another podcast episode. We already have so many other things that we could talk about, but I just pray God's continued blessing over your business and all of the lives that you are impacting. I think it's only just the beginning. I appreciate that so much. Thanks for having me on. Hey guys, Anna here. If you found this video helpful, then you do not want to miss this video right here beside me on the screen. Click on it. I know you're going to enjoy it. You guys remember... You cannot be redefined, only redeveloped one imperfect day at a time. Your story matters and you are loved.